morning. God is good all the time. What a wonderful joy it is this morning to begin this service with baptism. Jeff Baker comes today to be baptized. Jeff, you come down here. I know his wife Tina's in the choir and his mother's here and extended family. Would you guys stand? Let us recognize you as a family. Friends, thank you guys. Amen. You know, I love, uh, I love that uh, Jeff was sharing with me. He's known the Lord for many years but just hasn't made this public profession through baptism and wanted to do that today. What a great testimony. What a great witness and example maybe to others that have yet to make that step of being baptized. <laughs> we had dinner with uh, he and Tina, wonderful couple, just so enjoyed uh, getting to know them and their faith and their love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, Jeff, let me ask you that most important question. Do you have the assurance to know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Yes, then, my brother, it is my privilege. Let's turn this way. It is my privilege upon your profession of faith in Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried as Christ was buried, raised as Christ was raised, to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. We serve a wonderful Savior today, don't we? How beautiful to see the baptism this morning. I just invite you to stand to your feet today as we worship the Lord together. It's time for us to turn our attention heavenwards. I know you've prepared your heart to worship the King today. Let's just join and worship this beautiful, beautiful gospel hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
So wonderful. We have a faithful and true God that we can put our hope in today. I tell you what, it'll make you smile on a Sunday morning. God is so good, isn't he? So faithful. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will. This is for the lost and lonely For the broken and afraid This is for those who are hurting Hoping help is on the way In these battles of addictions When fear is chasing after me yeah. Whatever trouble I am facing yeah. Oh, I will lift my hands and sing. Yeah. I believe in miracle power, in a wonder-working God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. He's working wonders in my heart. I belong to a loving Father. I'm a friend of Christ, His Son.
you may be seated. Woo! Bless the name of the Lord today. We read in Exodus, the Lord is faithful. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Deuteronomy, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant. Psalms, prove me, O Lord, and try me, test me in my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge, his faithfulness is a shield and buckler the works of his hands are faithful and just all his precepts are trustworthy to be performed with faithfulness forever O oh Lord your word is firmly fixed in the heavens your faithfulness endures through all generations the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all of his works. Isaiah says, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. Lamentations because of the Lord's great love. We are not consumed, for his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. First Corinthians, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but as common to man, for God is faithful. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved fame, blameless before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because he who calls you is faithful. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. <laughs> we are faithless, but he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of earth. Then I saw the heavens open and behold a white horse and the one who sits on it is called faithful and true. Behold, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord has made to the house of Israel has failed. It has all come to pass. I don't know about you this morning, but I believe God is faithful. Amen. I want you to just worship the Lord as the choir and orchestra sing this beautiful, beautiful song this morning. He has been faithful. Thank you. 
Good morning, church family. At this time in our service, we're going to continue worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Um, on the screen behind me, uh, we have four easy ways for you to give. You can give online at bsfbc.org slash give. Um, you can text any amount to Kindred to the number on the screen. You can mail a check or drop it off in the business hours. Um, or you can stop by any of these offering boxes on your way out of the sanctuary today. <clears throat> uh, a quick reminder for all of you. Easter is upon us, okay? And it is March 31st. So it is in March this year. We do not want that to sneak up on you. We want to make sure that you know about that. We're having our regular services that Sunday. We're also having a good Friday service that Friday at 7 p.m. Um, so we want you to be aware of those things. And also we don't want it to sneak up on your neighbors or your family or your coworkers. So next week when you come in here, we will have some invite cards for you to hand out. Um, to remind whoever that is, whoever you want to invite to the Easter service on March 31st. We are two weekends away from the weekend, um, which means I've actively gone into hibernation. I try to sleep two extra hours a night, hoping that that somehow helps me uh, make it through that weekend with a little extra energy. Um, that is March 22nd through the 24th, um, and we are hosting that. And this year, instead of hosting it on our campus, we are actually hosting it on the high school campus, which is really cool for us. Um, but really cool for our students to get to have uh, those memories of time just worshiping on their campus and growing together in the Lord. Um, it's not just us. We're hosting seven other churches um, over at the high school with us. So we're really excited about that. This is the last week. If you have a 6th through 12th grader, this is the last week to sign them up for that. Um, so that is online at bsfbc.org slash events, and that is two weeks away. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, one extra way that you can help with students uh, is this. Y'all have heard me talk about camp uh, and raising money for students, and this is a really cool thing that we get to do this week. And it's one of those things where sometimes you have an idea, and then lots of people shut it down, and you realize it was a bad idea. And sometimes you have one, and everyone says yes. Um, and this was one of those. So we are having a student's fundraiser feast week this week. 
Um, so if you choose to eat dinner out any night, Monday through Thursday, we urge you to consider one of these options. Um, all of them on Highway 9, so you don't have to go far. Uh, Monday night from 5 to 8 p.m. is actually not Super Chick, so flip the two chicken places. So if you're taking a picture of this, make a note. Uh, Monday night is actually Zaxby's from 5 to 8. Monday night is Zaxby's from 5 to 8, if you're taking that down or adjusting the picture and editing that, however you've done that. Um, Tuesday night from 11 a.m., so you can even get lunch in on Tuesday, from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., a percentage of everything that they sell um, will go to the student missions. Wednesday night from 5 to 8 um, will be at Rigsby's. And then Thursday night is actually at Super Chicks, not at Zaxby's. So bookend your chickens. Um, we do it on both ways. And it's really cool. Um, and this isn't one of those things where I, like, sneakily went to each one of them. Each person that I called from these restaurants, I said, hey, we're trying to do this. I'm trying to fill a week. I'm calling. I literally told them the other restaurants I was calling. And everybody green-lighted us. Everyone was excited about it and excited to help out. So we have those local business owners um, who care about our students in this community that much that they said, yeah, we want to be a part of your feast week. Um, I tried to really sell it to them, and everybody seemed to love it. Um, so the fact that we live in a community that cares that much, that Monday through Thursday you can eat on Highway 9, um, and a percentage of that is going to student missions. Um, so that's really cool. We appreciate it. We're going to be, I'll be at most of those. Um, you'll see a lot of familiar student faces, those, if you show up. Um, and make sure you mention us when you go through um, so that they give that percentage to us. So we're super, th super thankful for that. Again, Monday's Axby's, Thursday's Super Chicks. The other two are good. Um, and we'll work on that. Uh, we'll be posting stuff this week, too, just to remind you about it. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we continue today. God, we thank you just for a chance to be here today. Thank you um, just to be a part of a community um, that cares about each other, Lord, um, that cares about not just students but um, every age, Lord, and they come together to support each other in any way that we can. We're thankful um, for the way that we see that as family that you have tied together, Lord, um, and that we each have our own purpose in that. So we continue to um, just pray that we would all lean into that, Lord. Um, and just be a part of this community and be a light to this community that you would have us to be. Um, so we thank you for who you are and what you've done um, and the way that you're going to bless your word through Pastor Hank today. Amen. amazing morning of worship. It's good to be in God's house, amen. I pray that this experience of worship every Sunday morning is a highlight of your week. Uh, what a blessing uh, to hear and experience God's presence through worship already this morning, uh, that it's a, it's a great experience for you, that you find home here if you're visiting with us, that you feel at home and feel welcome here, but mostly that you allow Jesus to make his home in you that you have a personal relationship with him, that you find family here. That happens in family groups or Sunday school where you really get to know people and they get to know you and you do life together in community. And then we want you to find purpose. We've been talking about stewarding our gifts and serving the Lord. And we want you to find a way that God can use you and your spiritual gifts through the ministries of this amazing church. But I couldn't help but think about a dad who had taken his, gone to the church with his family. And on the way home, it was one of those days that dad had nothing but complaints. The music was too loud. The, the, the sanctuary was too hot. The sermon was too long. Everything was too much of this or too little of that. And finally, the little boy in the back seat interrupted him and said, Dad, but you got to admit, Dad, you got to admit, it was a pretty good show for a dollar. <laughs> Ouch. I hope it's worth more than a dollar this morning. <laughs> Max Yarman was a great Christian businessman, internationally known. Uh, gave millions of dollars to the work of the Lord, built churches around the world, faithfully served and gave to his local church his tithe and offerings and supported other Christian ministries as well. But about middle ways in his life, he had a financial reversement and, uh, and all reversal, and, and, and uh, he lost his company. He lost millions of dollars, a great portion of his, his plans for retirement. He lost so much, almost everything. One of his friends, in the midst of that difficult and dark time, went to him and, and asked him, Maxie, do you regret giving all those millions and millions of dollars 
of the church and the work of the Lord, thinking about what he could have with that money now. Here's what he said, not at all. I only lost what I kept for myself. In God's economy, what we keep, we lose. What we give to God is ours forever. What an amazing perspective of stewardship. We're looking this morning in this We Are series, we've been looking at our our stewardship of our gifting, of our time, and now this morning of our resources. We are faithful stewards of our resources. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Really, originally, 1 and 2 Chronicles were all one book, and this is the journal of the journey of the nation of Israel, and really, in particular, of the story of David, king of Israel. And uh, this is uh, the, the swan song of David's life. This is the closing statement. This is the legacy he leaves. This is his final real act as a king other than anointing Solomon as king, which happens as well in chapter 29. But it's an amazing expression of stewardship of David's resources and of the people of God and their resources. And I want you to see several principles out of this text. First of all, We want you to see that stewardship really requires that we have a proper vision of who God is. And really and truthfully, everything else about our life, about our decisions, about who we are, must be informed first and foremost by our understanding of who God is. And so I want you to see, first of all, that David had a proper vision of who God is. Until we see Jesus and experience him for who he is, and until that that focus informs everything else in our lives, we really uh, will never understand any aspect of really stewarding our lives for his glory and for his kingdom's sake. But look at David. He has a proper understanding of that. Look at verse 10 through 12. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of the assembly. And David said, so really, this is the prayer of David. This is David praying. And he says, blessed are you, O Lord, God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. I want you to first of all see that David's prayer is oriented first and foremost and centered on God. I confess that's convicting. Oftentimes my prayer begins, God, help. I need you to do this. I need this to happen. God, I'm praying for this. I'm praying for that. And yet David's prayer is oriented first and foremost around seeing who God is a vision of God. It's all about you, God. It's not about me. It's a proper understanding and vision of who God is. And that should inform everything else in our lives. And so how much of your prayer time, how much of my prayer time is really fixated on and focused on and oriented toward seeing Jesus for who he is? And David has that focus. Look at verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness Yours, O Lord, is the power. Yours, O Lord, is the glory. Those words sound familiar? Now listen, if if I ask that and the first thing went to Charlotte's Web and the things that she spun on the words for Wilbur, that's not really where I was going with that. Those are Jesus' words are very similar. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Many believe that those words that Jesus taught his disciples in some sense came even out of these words, these superlatives, these words that David is seeing and experiencing God. He has a vision of who God is. He's great. He is powerful. He, the word of glory is kabod. He's, it means to have heavy weight. It means the one most significant in our lives. He says, and yours is the victory. And yours is the majesty, that word means splendor or radiance. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. That was David's prayer of praise and adoration and exaltation of the glory of God. Listen, unless that is the focus of our life, of our prayer, any idea of stewarding my time, my talents, my treasures is going to seem ridiculous and irrelevant and unimportant and misplaced. That's why the world who looks around and says, you come to church on Sunday morning, you steward your time by saying this is an important priority in your life and the life of your family, when you could do so many other things, they don't get it because they haven't seen the glory of God. 
That's why people in the world out there say, man, you give money to the church and resources and serve and time. You really do that? When Think of all the things you could be doing for yourself, all the gains you'd be getting. Think about all the things you could do with the money. They don't get it because they haven't experienced the glory of God. The question is, have we? Have we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten Son of God? Have we seen Jesus? That should capture us. That should be the all-consuming passion is to see him. And that view of God informs everything else in David's life. Now, we know King David's journey, and it was not perfect by any means, but he was called a man after God's own heart. We certainly see his flaws and his failures, and so we all recognize that as well. But I think this is the thing that endeared David to God, is that he always had a passionate view and a proper view of who God is. That view of God is then informs and gives us a proper view of who we are. Look at verse 15, for we are sojourners before you, strangers and tenants, as all our fathers were, our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope. And what David is saying, there, there is no hope in this world. There is no hope within ourselves. We have nothing within ourselves or within this world that we can find hope in. In other words, saying only in you, God, can we find hope. And as the psalmist who wrote, who wrote most of the psalms, we hear that over and over. You, God, are our refuge. You are our present help. You, O oh God, are our Savior. You're our hope. You're our shalom, our peace. And so David has a proper view of, of God, and that informs his proper view of himself as saying, we are not the, that. We, are, we fail. We fall short. I think of Isaiah and his vision. You remember that in Isaiah chapter 6. It's interesting about the, the book of Isaiah. It's 66 chapters. How many books are there in the Bible? 66. Did you know that they're divided, really two sections, 39 chapters and 27 chapters? How many books in the Old Testament? 39, New Testament, 20. It's amazing, isn't it, how we see such a, a, a journey of Scripture in the book of Isaiah. But chapter 6, verse 1 is really Isaiah's proper view of God. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. And the seraphim gathered around, and they were on either side with their wings covering him, and they were saying, holy Holy, holy is the Lord God. That view of God gave Isaiah a proper view of himself. And he fell prostrate before him and said, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And when we see Jesus in all of his glory and behold him in his majesty and his greatness and his power, and we make that the orientation of our hearts, we will have a fair and true evaluation and understanding of ourselves that without him we are without hope without him we can do nothing and are nothing without him it is all meaningless as the solomon the, the author of ecclesiastes says then i want you to see his view of who god is also informs his perspective and enables him to have a proper perspective of his resources and that's true for us there in verse 12 through 16 both riches and honor come from who? From you. And you rule over all. Listen to this. And in your hand is power and might. And it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. Look at the second part of verse 14. For all things come from you. How many things? All things come from you, he says there. All things come from you, and from your hand we have given you. Even what we are giving has come from your hand. Oh, Lord, verse 16, our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build a house for your holy name, it is from your hand, and all is what? Mine. No. A proper perspective of our resources is to declare all is yours, God. You own everything. All that I have is yours. My life, all the resources that I have, 
one pastor shared that God owns everything about our lives, all of our property, all of our resources, everything that we have. And he went up and protested. He was a wealthy man and had vast expanses of land. And this, this man said, listen, you look at all that land, pastor. Look at all the wealth I've worked hard and I've accrued and all these things. Look at all this that I own. You're trying to tell me God owns that and not me? And the pastor said, I want you to ask me that same question in 100 years. Hello? Yeah, in 100 years, he ain't going to own any of it, is he? We don't own it. But do we believe that? You know what? Until we see a proper view of who God is, we don't get that. We believe we own it. We believe it's ours. We believe we've deserved it. We believe we should be able to do. We don't have that sense that all of it belongs to him. But David says, no, no, make no mistake. It all is yours. Until we have a proper perspective of our resource and say it all belongs to you, God, and I'm going to steward it according to your will in a way that's pleasing in your sight and for your glory, then we fail to understand what it really means to steward our resources in a way that pleases him. And look, finally, that leads to a proper response. The only proper response when we see God for who he is, the only proper response, there are not a multiplicity of options here. The only response that we can have is to be giving, to have a giving spirit. And we see that spirit of David, that stewarding spirit of his resources, that giving spirit of David, as well as all of the people of God on this occasion, beautifully displayed. Let me just show you several things about that giving spirit after we see God for who he is. We are willing to steward our resources for his glory because he has it all. First of all, it's a spirit of generosity. It's characterized by generosity. Look at verse 14, the first part. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? You see, that's a spirit that doesn't say it's my obligation. That's my spirit that says it's my privilege. That's the spirit that says I don't have to. I get to. Does that describe your heart as it relates to giving of your resources to the Lord? That is the only response that is pleasing to the Lord and worthy of his great name. As we are the redeemed of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the only response that is, that is fitting and pleasing and acceptable. Generosity, look at this secondly, willingly, look at verse 17, since I know, oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness. I, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all these things. So now with joy I have seen your people who present here or are present here make their offerings willingly to you. Does that describe your spirit of generosity, your spirit of stewardship, your spirit of giving resources to the work of the Lord? You see, David is saying this. Our resources really are a barometer of our heart health. Our resources really are a barometer of our spiritual well-being. It's as if our money and our giving is an evaluation of the orientation of our heart. When our heart is oriented to Jesus Christ and we see him where he is, everything and anything we can do for his glorious name is seen as a privilege and a joy, and we do it willingly voluntarily, not earning a coercion, not earning his, but cheerfully, as Paul says. But when our orientation is to the world, when our orientation is comparing ourselves to everybody else, and how much do I have and what does my life look like, and when our orientation is earthly and worldly, then again, our perspective on willingness, it, it becomes a duty. And we give out of a duty what we do give. We give begrudgingly. May I quote Bono here, the great theologian Bono? I, I don't know. I can't speak for him. I've heard him make very clear statements in the last few years of his personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord, the risen one, and uh, give a clear profession of faith that John Daly had focused on the family. But I, I'll leave that to the Lord and him. But here's what he said, and I thought it was a powerful statement. Only after the truth has its way can a clenched fist become an open hand. Now that's powerful. 
only until the truth of who he is has its way in my heart can I take these clenched fists that holds mine and claims this is mine and God, I'll do what I want to do and opens those hands and say, no, no, it all belongs to you and I will steward it for your glory. Willingly, he says, that is the response of a heart, giving heart that has see, that sees God for who he is. That was David's heart. That was the heart of all of the people of God. Then look sacrificially in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. David is purchasing the land where the temple in Jerusalem will be built. And a man named Aaronu, Aaronah holds, uh, owns it. And uh, he offers to give it to David for the purposes of building the temple of God as an honor. But David says, however, the king said to Aaronah, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God which cost me nothing. David leads in his giving in a sacrificial way. As a matter of fact, look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, the, first, the second half of verse 1 and verse 2. For the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now with all of my ability I provided for the house of God, he says. And he goes on to talk about, I've given these things by, delightfully to the house of God. I've given my treasure. And you know what some scholars say? Some scholars really believe that David gave all of his treasure. That he didn't give God from his treasure, he actually gave God his treasure. And some have suggested that in today's monetary evaluation, the amount that David alone gave would be about $5 billion. But irregardless of what how much of his treasure he gave, he gave it sacrificially. And then the people followed, and they gave sacrificially, and they did it with great delight, with great joy, the Bible says. But it is the only proper response of our heart that is oriented to see Jesus for he is, to then desire to give sacrificially away anything that we can are able to do for the Lord's work, to the glory of God, for his kingdom purposes. Oh, I wish there were a lot more amens in the house of God today. I know it's not easy when we talk about our resources. And I know that perhaps we haven't heard many sermons about our resources. But listen, again, this is, a, this is an audit of our heart. This is a spiritual audit of our heart this morning. How's your heart faring under the audit of the Holy Spirit in regard to how we treat our resources? Are we passing that audit with flying colors because we see who he is and we're in awe of his glory and his grace that would save us? How's the audit of your heart this morning? My heart preached to me always before I ever am able to preach to anyone else to apply God's word. Look, I want you to see not only was he giving generously and willingly and sacrificially, but David gave generationally. Look at verse 1 of chapter 29. Then King David said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is still young and experienced, and the work is great. Man, this amazes me about David. But David will absolutely raise the entirety of the funds needed to build a building that he will never lay his eyes on. That he will never step into. That he's doing all of this for the future generations. Just to please the Lord in his time. He's generationally giving so that the next generation will be prepared. So Solomon will be prepared and enabled to accomplish all that God has for him. And on and on generationally, he has that spirit to give. Beyond his time, I think about this church. As we sit in this amazing sanctuary this morning. There have been 250 years of legacy giving, of people giving generationally, of people in their time giving sacrificially and giving generationally so that the next generation has a place. The next generation has an opportunity. The next generation can accomplish the work of God. The next generation and generation after generation after generation has led us to this place, to this point, to this moment in a community like Boiling Springs. Who could have imagined just a few years ago, let alone 50, 75, or 100 years ago, what this place would look like? around us but they saw with their hearts 
as they gave generationally to believe God was going to do something in the generations. They gave not for themselves, but for the future. That kind of generational giving honors God. That kind of generational giving impacts the kingdom as it did in the life of David. This amazing work. And so I ask this morning, based on our stewardship of our resources and the orientation of our heart this morning, are we handing the next generation an enablement to accomplish all that God has for them? Are we handing to the next ministry team, to the next, to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next group of people, these students, these children, this is their just always highly valued children and students, and you've rallied and supported those things so sacrificially, so amazingly. And I think, again, it speaks to your heart to believe that it is for the generations to come, and we're faithfully serving God and giving sacrificially and lovingly and cheerfully and willingly and generously. Yes, for the blessing of God in our time, but for the blessing of God yet to come in generations beyond us. Can I say this? God is the ground of all giving. What is the standard that we measure our giving by? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is the standard of our giving, who not only gave until it hurt, but he gave through the hurt and took on our sins on the cross and suffered and died for us. He gave his all. He gave his life. That's the standard of our giving is to follow in Jesus' footsteps. This is the season where we take offerings for Lottie Moon. We take Annie Armstrong Christmas offerings and Lottie Moon Easter offerings. That means everything we give toward the Lottie Moon offer goes directly to foreign missions. But I want you to, I want you to listen to this quote of Lottie Moon in regard to our giving and her, her strong encouragement and an unapologetic ask for the people back in the United States to give generously to the work of missions. She said, I wonder how many of us really believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive. A person who accepts that statement of the Lord Jesus Christ as a fact and not as an impractical idealism will make giving a principle of his or her life. They will lay aside sacredly not less than one-tenth of their income or earnings as the Lord's money, which they would no more dare touch for personal use as they would to steal. How many there are there among men and, our men and women, alas, who imagine that because Jesus paid it all, they need pay nothing, forgetting that the prime object of their salvation was that they should follow in his footsteps, in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of us, Jesus paid it all. I don't have to pay. And listen, we don't have to pay anything for our salvation. We don't have to do anything in our salvation. It is the gift of his great grace and love bestowed upon us. But if we've truly experienced that and see him for who he is, and that's the orientation of our heart, then how can we say anything but, Lord Jesus, I give myself, I give my all, I give everything that I can for the sake of your glory. I want to steward my time, yes, my talent, sure, but my treasure as well, in a way that honors and pleases you. Oh, God has blessed us. God has blessed us all so far beyond what we could imagine. And every good and perfect gift comes down from our heavenly Father above, and he delights in allowing us to enjoy those gifts that he's bestowed upon us. But all of that must come out of and flow from our sense of vision of who he is and the opportunity we have to serve him. That was a young lady that followed in Jesus' footsteps, her name was uh, Hattie Mae Wyatt. Hattie Mae was lived, lived in the late 1800s in Philadelphia, and one day she was out in front of Grace Baptist Church, and as she was standing there, she stood outside. It was, it was a church that there were a lot of people inside it, and it was packed. It wasn't a huge building, but it was packed, and she was alone. But she wanted so bad to go into church and so bad to, to sing with those people and to, and to worship the Lord. But she was afraid to go in, and by herself, about that time, Pastor Conway, or uh, Pastor Conwell, happened to come by, standing outside, seeing her there. He introduced himself, and she said, I want to go in, but I'm by myself, and I'm afraid, and it's so full of so many people, and, and I don't know about other children, and I'm by myself. And he said, he picked little Hattie up and put her, put her on his shoulders, walked into the church, took her to a Sunday school class, and sat her with a group of girls her age. 
And that became a fixture in little Hattie Mae's life. She loved Jesus. She came to church every week. Pastor Conwell never forgot his first encounter with little Hattie Mae out there and her desire to be in church as a child. And then he thought, I wonder how many more children are in this city. And he told little Hattie when he met her that day, he said, one day, Hattie, we're going to build a building here where we can hold all the little children of the city, a much bigger church that can accommodate all of the people that want to come and worship him. Not long after that, he got the news. Little Hattie Mae had passed away. Her mother came to visit him. And she said, Pastor Conwell, after it was after Hattie's funeral, Pastor Conwell, I want to give you something. He handed her a bag. In that bag was two quarters and a nickel and two pennies, 57 cents. He said, this was under her pillow. She has been saving money ever since you talked about building a church where all the kids could come from Philadelphia like her and have a place to worship Jesus. He was so inspired by Hattie's 57 cents, which was a huge sacrifice for this little girl, setting aside everything she could for the sake of the work of the Lord, that he told his people about it, and they made all those pennies, those 57 pennies, and then they auctioned them off and raised a large sum of money, but that led to a Hattie Mae Wyatt society. And they continued to, to be inspired by her story, Generations continue to hear her story. Now listen to me. 57 cents turned into something amazing. Because if you go to Temple Baptist Church today, it seats 3,300. The church that Pastor Conwell built. But not only that, it inaugurated and initiated a hospital in Philadelphia that tens of thousands of people have been blessed by and helped. Not only that, it started a university that still is active called Temple University in Philadelphia that started out of a 57-cent sacrificial gift, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ by a little girl named Hattie, Hattie Mae Wyatt. Not only that, not long ago, they had a reunion and they had a gathering to celebrate Hattie Mae and all that had been accomplished. Listen, there were 60 other churches that had been birthed out of that church that they came together to thank God and celebrate all that had been accomplished with what began as a 57 cent sacrificial offering to the Lord. Little Hattie May, they named the church of a sanctuary after her. Little Hattie May has impacted the kingdom of God in ways that will never be computed and never be able to be measured. And her gift continues to give. And every one of us can be Hattie May. God wants all of us to have that same heart as Hattie Mae that we desire because we see who he is to give and be stewards faithfully of the resources that he's blessed us with. Yes, to enjoy, to be faithful in every area of our life, absolutely, but also and without neglecting but celebrating the opportunity to give to the great work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. And uh, I know this, again, is not a text that we generally like. And, and if you're visiting here today, just know this. We, we are not ashamed to speak on tithing or giving to the Lord. Jesus spoke often of how we treat our financial resources as the, the lesser things, not the really spiritual gifts, not the true riches, but just to measure, again, an audit of our heart and the orientation of our life. But we always let the text determine where we go and so we speak the word of God and try to do that faithfully in all aspects of that and we are a people who believe in being faithful stewards we're here because of faithful stewards and we will continue as a church as long as the Lord tarries because of the faithful stewardship of the people of God here so I just wonder with our heads bowed and eyes closed we, we're going to extend an invitation maybe it's not related to anything to giving but maybe it's a statement of your faith that you want to honor God this morning as a steward of, of what God's blessed you with. And the Holy Spirit's made you aware. You certainly can, can work and allow the Holy Spirit to meet the need in your heart right where you are. But I wonder with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not going to do anything even to, to ask you to lift your hands, but maybe you want to know what it means to be of a church that believes in stewardship. We'd love to welcome you to the family, be a part of this body of Christ, an amazing family of God. 
Maybe you have a decision as Pastor, as Brother Jeff came forward in baptism. Maybe you want to step forward to honor God in that way. But I just wonder with the pastors here, we just take a few moments as Pastor Lucas plays in this time of invitation. Let's just bow before the Lord and let's let the Holy Spirit do that audit in our hearts this morning. And let's reorient ourselves. Let's rededicate, let's renew our hearts and our affections to be first and foremost on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength this morning. Let's reorient our hearts to him, to see him for who he is, to behold his glory afresh and anew today. And let that be what informs all of who we are this morning. As we wait before the Lord in these few moments, would you just allow the Holy Spirit to speak and work in your heart in this time? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to a church with such a rich history, a long history, blessed history. We could never recount the names and faces of those generations that have come before us. We've handed that baton of stewardship to us so faithfully. Lord, we thank you for this body of Christ that has taken up that mantle of stewardship in every way of our service, of our talents and our, and our tra- time, as well as our treasure that enables the ministries of this church to reach not only around this community and this county and this state, not only across the United States, but allows this church to have an influence around the world. And your kingdom is advancing in miraculous and amazing ways because of the heart of stewardship of the men and women of this church, this family of God. And I praise you for them. Thank you for them. Pray your blessings upon them. Lord, as David said to that whole assembly, let's bless the Lord together. Lord, we bless your name. It said they bowed and paid homage to the Lord. Lord, we we bow and prostrate ourselves as a posture of humility as we think of who you are. And we bless your name and we proclaim your name. Yours is the greater, yours is the greatness, yours is the power, yours is the glory, yours is the victory, yours is the majesty, yours is the dominion. Lord, you are above all today. And we worship you and we want our lives to be an expression of that worship as we faithfully steward our lives. Individually and as a corporate body in this time name of Lord Jesus Christ, we say together, amen. Amen. God is great all the time. Enjoy the Lord today. Be blessed. Make your way to a family group if you haven't yet been. And listen, you can pick up a copy of the budget. We'll be voting on that next week out in the atrium and the vestibule and take that with you and look that over. Pray about it.